Warning, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network. Uh, this webinar is uh, co-coordinated, or well the network is co-coordinated by uh, NatureServe and OpenChannels.org and we have Nick Weiner who uh, is joining us from OpenChannels.org uh, as co-host. And um, today we'd like to welcome today Jonathan Clow and Marco Propato from Warren Pinnacle Consulting and they're going to be speaking about uh, a decision support tool for coastal area management based on results of the sea level affecting marshes model, uh, better known as SLAM. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we highly encourage questions, uh, well, to some degree during and then after the webinar. Uh, we can handle quick clarifying questions during the webinar and then more substantive questions at the end. And We will have a dedicated time for question and answer at the end. So if you have questions and uh, of any sort, you can send them in during the, the webinar um, by typing the question into the question panel of the user interface. Now, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll stop Jonathan and Marco um, for any quick clarifying questions that you have uh, and get some answers then, but uh, more substantive questions, again, we'll hold till the end. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Jonathan and Marco. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so I want to talk uh, today about um, a, an ISERTA funded project which uh, built on um, the previous application that we did of SLAM to the coast of uh, coastal New York. Um, and so our, we had three goals of this new pro project. The first one was to um, run new SLAM simulations that included infrastructure effects. And that would both give us a sense of the effects that infrastructure had on wetland migration, but also assess um, the vulnerability of roads and buildings to future flooding. Uh, that's a combination of sea level rise and storm surge scenarios. So storm surge was brought in uh, to our model parameters. Um, and then what I really want to talk about uh, today are the, the, the next two bullets, which is creating the, uh, a decision support tool. Um, the, concept here is that uh, once you have a lot of model results that show you uh, potential um, uh, marsh futures uh, under different sea level rise scenarios uh, and uncertainty analysis, how, how can you then use that to uh, support decision making? Um, and also um, to show how we are running the model with uh, adaptation strategies. So I'm going to be uh, very quick going over the background of this project just because uh, well, I really want to get to uh, kind of how we're post-processing the results and how we're working with the results at that point. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the SLAM model. Um, I just want to mention that it is a, it's a landscape model um, that um, will forecast marsh movement uh, under sea level rise and marsh fate. Um, so it's a combination. It both gives you the fate of existing marshes and also potential marsh migration pathways. Uh, and it does take into account um, accretion feedbacks, uh, vertical marsh movement, and sedimentation rates. Um, so there's, uh, there's a lot of information about the previous applications available um, in some reports that I'll be giving you links to um, just a little bit later. Another very important piece of this uh, is that the SLAM model includes an uncertainty analysis, uh, which uh, uncertainty estimation, which accounts for uncertainty in all input data parameters. Uh, future sea level rise is highlighted here because this is a particularly important driving variable, but also all of the spatial um, variable in the model um, is, uh, we, we is subject to uncertainty, and we assess that. Um, so in the upper left of your screen here, you, you see an example of an uncertainty analysis this is, uh, I believe, 200 different model realizations, and it shows how you can derive confidence intervals, but then also see uh, plot sea level rise scenarios, um, sort of what we call the deterministic model results within that, and shows uh, how important those sea level rise scenarios are in terms of uh, driving the model results. Um, there are a number of different ways that you can summarize uncertainty uh, analysis results. Uh, percentage likelihood maps um, have really been one of the most powerful tools that we have uh, been working with, and Marco is going to show you some of those um, in just a few minutes. So as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, pro 
project is built on a previous NYSERDA funded project. Uh, there's a couple of URLs here uh, if you want to check those down. The top one is a, uh, a publication in the literature. The bottom one is the um, report that we produced for NYSERDA. A tiny URL is case sensitive um, following the slash. So, but the what we the in terms of the the slam results themselves, we did a number. We're doing a number of updates for those. Um, a new elevation data layer has been brought into place. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, we're explicitly accounting for road elevations. Um, we have uh, added a model update to include marsh collapse when marshes change types. Often there is a collapse in the soil structure. So we're using some data from. Um, uh, David Burdick and, and UNH to characterize uh, how much of that may be happening and that's obviously part of the uncertainty analysis as well. <clears throat> and also the, the latest New York uh, State sea level rise scenarios are being utilized. So again, um, this is an example of some um, uh, output which shows that we actually uh, are producing shape files of roads and how frequently they are flooded under a combination of sea level rise and storm surge. Uh, and these roads are broken down into five meter segments. So we're not going to say, well, an entire road is flooded, but we'll tell you exactly where uh, that road is predicted to be flooded. This is a, a current condition map, um, and it goes from uh, the red um, area, which is uh, predicted to be always flooded uh, or flooded um, at least once every 30 days, and the blue area being uh, a 100-year storm surge, um, and infrastructure uh, point data are also in, in place uh, that include, uh, we'll give you some information about the vulnerability of schools, fire stations. Uh, I think there's about a dozen different infrastructure categories that we're uh, putting into place. Um, and we do, uh, um, some of these roads that are currently predicted to be flooded, we actually, um, this is an older result, but we actually cut those out of our uh, model results uh, because in many cases that's just a problem with the bare earth elevation removing a bridge. So this is the same result under one meter of sea level rise. You can see that there's an awful lot of roads segments in this part of Westchester County. I should mention that our study area is, in, uh, is slightly smaller than the previous subject. Um, it's, uh, it's New York City, five boroughs, Westchester County, and Nassau County um, at this point that we're, uh, we're doing this evaluation for. So under one meter sea level rise, uh, there's quite a bit more vulnerability, and under two meters sea level rise, a lot of roads are regularly flooded, and you can see that the 100-year storm penetrates further. Um, so um, that's really the background of the model, and now I'm going to hand off to Marco to talk about how we're modeling adaptation strategies. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, so the previous project, as uh, Jonathan was saying, uh, we developed the SLAM model for the New York, uh, Long Island, and New York City area. And in this project, we are focusing on trying to evaluate some adaptation strategies in order to respond to climate change. And uh, together with uh, the New York City parks, uh, we consider four adaptation strategies to evaluate uh, under sea level rise. And uh, these are mentioned uh, in this uh, slide here. The first one, which is the, the, the most obvious or simple one, is to allow marsh migration in uh, undeveloped dry area. And so this is an adaptation strategy to consider acquisition or transfer of parcel uh, in order to allow this migration. Um, the second adaptation strategy is to actually restore developed areas like a parking lot or areas that right now are uh, developed and, and uh, make them undeveloped and make them available to marsh migration. The, th the third uh, adaptation strategy that New York City Park is considering is restoring uh, the original marsh footprints from the 1970s wetland maps. Um, and this is then, uh, we kind of try to implement that in SLAM by basically considering the, the map of the 1974 and change everything that today is uh, open water or tidal flat, but in 1974 was a marsh, make it uh, a marsh again. And with this update also, we update the elevation to a, an approximate uh, mean tide level um, elevation. 
And this is basically mimicking the restoration, really, that is occurring also that is going on in some, in some sites uh, around New York in, in the late, latest year. The fourth um, adaptation strategy that we consider is the thin layer deposition of uh, dredge material on low marsh in order to provide some elevation capital to marshes that are maybe uh, drowning or low in the tidal frame and we boost their elevation. And uh, after doing some research and references, we, we, we basically consider a, an addition of 20 centimeter of dredge material on a low marsh area at uh, some future time step and uh, this is done within a 60 meter boundary from either open water or dry land to mimic the um, high pressure spray that can be done from uh, uh, a boat or a truck. So uh, next slide please. So here I'm going to show the result, uh, a, sim a simple case, a, a, an example result from uh, W.T. Davis Marsh Parcel that is in uh, Staten Island. And next. Uh, today this is the land cover for uh, W.T. Davis. It's uh, mostly uh, high marsh with fringes of low marsh in blue and tidal flat and surrounded by dry land around. Next. So first, the first, uh, this first image I'm showing is the current footprint of the current marsh. So this is basically all the area of, uh, that is today either uh, low marsh or high marsh. And in the next slide, I'm showing the results that is coming out from all our Monte Carlo simulation where we considered uh, several realization of the model and here I'm showing uh, all the areas that get at, some, in at least one of these simulations become a marsh because of sea level rise. And so this is basically the green showing the potential marsh migration in uh, undeveloped area on top of the current uh, marsh footprint. While the next slide where we allow the marsh migration in developed area, uh, in this case in, uh, um, in this uh, parcel there are not too many opportunities and maybe some of them are actually in practice impossible because maybe it's a building but at least hydraulically that could be possible. And these are, these are in uh, pink uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this image. The next slide, we considered the marsh restoration in uh, to the 1974 boundaries. And so in this case, it's, uh, the boundaries, everything that is edging the tidal flat today would be restored to a marsh system, uh, to a low, low marsh system and would add uh, acreage to the marsh system. Now we are not only providing image of the footprint but uh, through the Monte Carlo simulation and the uncertainty estimation we actually provide the uncertainty maps and the next slide shows exactly that that is not only the footprint of the new marsh migration in undeveloped area but also the associated probability among all the different uh, model realization and as expected, the areas that border the current marsh system have a high probability to be colonized by uh, a, the marsh migration, while the further you go away from the marsh system or the higher you go really, uh, the probability becomes a little bit less likely. So in terms of planning and management, this provides a very important information when you are thinking about uh, uh, parcel appropriation or uh, acquisition. Obviously, uh, the map, we consider also the entire map where all the different strategies are considered in the next slide. And this is really the probability map of when all the different uh, adaptation strategies are considered. And here you can see that the current marsh system still have a good probability to be a marsh in uh, 2085 while all the fringes around are of the, the, the 
less probable area that uh, could uh, accommodate migration. And also here it is interesting to notice in this parcel that uh, the uh, restoration of the marsh uh, of the, on the 1974 marsh uh, over time it becomes again uh, a little bit uh, um, vulnerable to sea level rise. As you can see, the blue edges around all the different creeks uh, that were restored in 1974. Um, obviously, these results are not the same. Uh, ah, yeah, uh, no, go back, yes. <laughs> Sorry, the thin layer. Because the thin layer, it's, uh, it was difficult to show in one picture, so I made a different image for the thin layer deposition effect. And in this picture, what we are showing is how much the probability to be a marsh in 2085 is boosted by the thin layer deposition on the existing marsh system. And the red, you know, the more pink you have, purple really, the more boost of probability you have. And you can see there are some areas that they really benefit from having this uh, boost on thin layer. And Overall, you can get a 6 or 7% higher probability to be a marsh in 2085 by this uh, um, adaptation strategy. And in the next slide, I'm showing a different case from different parcels to show here, this is Pelham Bay Cove, um, also in New York City, uh, where in this case, the opportunity for uh, restoring a developed area is much more significant. As you can see, the little uh, pink area on the left, which is a parking lot, and New York City uh, Park is considering actually to uh, remove this parking lot and make it available for mass marsh migration. At the same time, uh, some other parcel, like the next one, um, Idlewild, the thin layer deposition is uh, uh, much more effective, as you can see, much more purple area, areas that basically boost more, they basically, they really provide a boost to the uh, survival of the marsh in 2085. Uh, so the, the main question that came out from all these uh, simulation is, uh, you have all these results and you can see how all these results are different. So the, the question is how we can now find a method for selecting the best or the, you know, the optimal op uh, adaptation strategies and which uh, uh, land parcel we should focus on. And this will be the next uh, section of the uh, seminar by Jonathan. Thanks, Marco. Um, so ultimately what we decided to try to put together for this project was an economic decision support tool, uh, which we've called the Dynamic Marsh Management Tool, uh, borrowing heavily from uh, the ideas of Sam Merrill, who's now with GEI Consultants, um, in, in terms of combining model results with economic surveys of, um, of what it is that um, stakeholders value about a given marsh. and so. Uh, the SLAM predictions, which we just showed quite a bit here, um, come into the model, but you also have an ecosystem uh, valuation assessment. So basically individuals um, are encouraged to define what it is that they value about an ecosystem and, and how much. Then you combine um, those ecosystem valuations with the SLAM predictions to say, okay, well, um, you know, get to develop a relationship between land cover types and those values, um, which we call utility functions. And this leads you to something which will give you um, a, a relative parcel value over time that can be uh, integrated. Um, and you can also evaluate alternative management actions over time and their values. Ultimately, if you have the um, uh, cost of parcels, or in this case also the cost of adaptation um, uh, scenarios, you can get a decision-making metric, which gives you really um, the uh, the benefit of each uh, adaptation strategy, um, the, the total benefit to uh, a given stakeholder or a group of stakeholders. So in terms of ecosystem services that uh, we defined, um, we uh, 
this is the list of ecosystem services that we have included in our model so far, although it is very flexible to allow addition of ecosystem services. Um, there is another tiny URL here if people are interested in how these are defined, uh, and also um, if people are, are helping out by filling out these surveys, uh, there will also be links there as well. Um, but ultimately, uh, the, the ecosystem benefits that we came up with through, through literature and through surveys and meetings with stakeholders were uh, nutrient sequestration, which can be carbon, nitrogen, or phosphorus, um, recreation in various forms, um, whether it be a dry land recreation, a wetland recreation, or uh, the provision of natural services to underserved communities, making sure that those natural areas um, don't disappear. Um, habitat functions, um, including nectin habitat and habitat connectivity. Flood protection, uh, it's well known that um, marshes will mitigate um, flood uh, waves um, and potentially protect infrastructure behind that. Uh, and then a few other uh, general uh, categories, which could be general preservation of natural areas, such as catch-all, or if there's one marsh that has a particular uh, historic value or political value that um, causes it to be valued more highly. And so the way that we uh, have been trying to ascertain these values has been through uh, prioritization surveys. Um, and so uh, we, we've created a couple of online surveys, and we, we've received a, a number of um, uh, over a dozen responses from stakeholders uh, in New York City, which is the top survey. And we're just in the process of releasing and uh, trying to get some information. We're going to be doing seven parcels in um, uh, Nassau County. Um, and so along with those surveys, uh, we, we worked with uh, DEC um, and other stakeholders in Nassau County to define um, basically a, um, a number of, of important marshes that they wanted to just get some more information about. It's really a case study that we're producing here. Um, and so along with those, you can see that there will be a document which describes the different um, areas and, and links to them and gives information about them. So what I, what I want to, the survey themselves um, survey in two different ways. First of all, it asks uh, users of the ecosystem services that they're looking at, what's most important to them on a relative basis? Uh, and the second question that it asks is, um, if you're looking across these sites, uh, which of these sites um, are, are better at providing these ecosystem services. Um, so for example, if we're looking at the case of um, uh, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus sequestration, uh, you could pretty much make the case that one acre of marsh in each of these different places may be sequestering the same amount of nutrients. Although you may also have some information about the marsh health and these or marsh density, which would cause you to have a different answer, for a site-specific answer. For recreation, uh, you could definitely have some differences there. And so this allows the users to give their site-specific information about the fact that, okay, in one of these wetlands, there's a boardwalk and it's regularly visited by um, you know, uh, school groups or, or the like, and another one um, has no access to the subway or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I'm going to show a little bit, uh, a quick demonstration of this tool, which uh, we've um, developed um, in Excel with a visual basic, uh, a very uh, simple visual basic driving um, software. And um, it's, uh, this will eventually be um, one of the deliveries for this project will be the, the, the final Excel spreadsheet. And we can, uh, we, we've already shared some samples um, for this. But um, so you start out with uh, a concept of just which sites you're looking at. Um, and, and you can actually, uh, if you'd like to, you can input a discount factor if you feel like you, uh, for your decision-making purposes, you value the marshes in 2100, say, for example, um, less than less than the marshes, um, less, less than you value the current uh, condition just due to a number of uncertainties or just a, um, then you can put a discount rate. Uh, or or uh, you can also select your, your, your period or what you're going to make your decision, whether it be, you know, 50 years, 20 years, 100 years. Um, and the next um, tab is labeled Delphi, and this shows the results. These are actually the results from 
the New York City survey that we have all uh, combined together, um, showing that um, in terms of what we surveyed, uh, carbon sequestration, when combined, is about 24% uh, of, of, of what people value. Habitat is very important, um, about 35%. Uh, flood protection is important, and recreation uh, also is about 15%. Um, in terms of uh, the site-specific differences between sites, um, those um, those weren't. There were some that were identified, but uh, in many cases there there were not really sharp differences that were identified. So this is one area where some additional refinement. Um, if, if you, for example, really knew that you personally valued recreation in one location more than another, then you could make those modifications. Um, uh, within the model are all the SLAM. Um, land cover summary. So for example, this shows the result. This is an expected value calculation um, that shows the, the land cover of, of Udall's Cove over time, showing that um, you get more and more open water in, in your expected value. Um, you get your, your salt marsh and your low tidal. Now, the, ex, the way the model works, it doesn't actually calculate on expected values, but it calculates on each of the uncertainty analysis realizations and calculates uh, a, an independent utility for each of those realizations. Um, then uh, you can look at um, the, the results. Um, it it pr presents you with an overall benefit. You can rank your sites. Uh, you can look at, um, at, at the results over time. So what this is showing is that um, given the inputs that we have in the model right now, which may not match your particular priorities, but um, just for this uh, case study, that um, Idlewild and W.T. Davis have the, have the largest amount of, of sort of ecosystem benefits that they're providing over the period of the simulation, but they also have more vulnerability. So they're dropping down quite a bit more than some of these other sites, which have uh, low, lower utility, but in some cases are kind of slow and steady. Um, and you can also look at the utility components that are predicted by site. So for example, in W.T. Davis, because these are relatively large sites and they have a lot of marsh, um, that the carbon sequestration, the nitrogen sequestration, and the phosphor, the phosphor sequestration are providing uh, more than half of the, the utility value for that site. Uh, so if you wanted to, uh, again, you could use this tool either to get an overall sense of, um, of, of, of like survey a group and get, get a, a consensus or, or a stable value in that group of what's valued, or if, as an individual, you, you might have different choices, and, and it's pretty easy to uh, test those out. You can say, okay, well, I know I have my own survey results here, and so I actually, let's say, for example, I, I wasn't interested in nutrient sequestration, um, and let's say, for example, I felt like the Idlewild um, had a much higher recreational potential, so we can increase those. Uh, then when you hit the calculate button, the model, start, the Visual Basic uh, starts reading the SLAM results, calculating these utilities, um, and uh, putting those into the uh, results. And then when you look at the prioritization results, uh, now it used to be W.T. Davis had the highest utility, and now Idlewild does, and if you look at the priorities over time, um, you can see that, uh, that that's reflected there, and you can also look at the utility components by site, and none of these uh, sequestration values are, are now in there. So it gives there's a lot of flexibility to play a lot of different games uh, and look at, uh, well, what if we had an individual who valued this, or what if we value this more than that? Um, now, um, so I went through these tool demos here. Um, I, I also wanted to discuss um, how do you get from the uh, the, the land cover predictions and the value, the ecosystem service value to um, the value. So basically what would the relative change in land cover, what effect would that relative change in land cover have on the uh, ecosystem service, the, the, the value that was, um, that was given? And to, to define those, we have a, a, a different utility function for each of the ecosystem services. Um, I don't have time to get into all of those today, although they are extremely flexible and editable within the process. But for example, with things like nutrient and carbon sequestration, it's fairly straightforward to go into the literature and say, okay, which marsh type uh, sequesters more of which type of nutrient, um, and then make a relationship of the marsh type that you're looking at, whether it's a high marsh, a low marsh, um, or you know, a tidal fresh marsh, which is pretty rare in the study area. And um, it, but 
when you look at things like um, the recreational value, for example, uh, there may be the relationship may be a, more of a site-specific relationship. So there's a lot of flexibility with regards to how uh, that relationship is set up in the model. But uh, we did actually have a stakeholder workshop um, in New York City where we went through all these utility functions uh, and uh, gathered the feedback from uh, the experts that were there and incorporated those into our uh, initial utility functions. So I want to now look at what happens when you combine the decision support tool with the adaptation strategies, you get some very interesting results. So I think this is the result that I just showed, um, showing that you know, these big areas, WT Davis um, and Idlewild, uh, have the most utility over time. And so this is the, what we might call, this is a no migration case. So this is just showing the utility of existing marshes. So if we add in migration to dry land, um, there's quite a jump in utilities, as you can see, I'll go back. And I'll go forth. So there's quite a jump in utility, as well as things like Alley, Alley Creek in Queens, uh, which shows a steady decline in ecosystem services, actually shows the potential for an increase in ecosystem services uh, if the marshes are allowed to migrate in that location. So that's an interesting result. Um, if you include the migration of developed dry land relative, uh, as well as dry land, you can see there's only a very small incremental increase. Uh, of course, it varies from site to site depending on how much developed dry land there is in each location. So I want to go back to the base case and look at the other two adaptation strategies. Um, the first one was the 1974, rest restoration of marshes, their 1974 footprint. And um, for the purpose of this analysis, we just assumed that those would be restored essentially at the beginning of the model run. And so you can see there's a, a quite a bit more utility on these sites. Um, you know, and some of these sites like Udall's Cove have a much higher jump than others. Um, again, going back to the base case, so this is the existing marsh, and now let's look at thin layer deposition on the existing marsh. And it's a, our analysis suggests that a single application of 20 centimeters of uh, sediment on the existing marshes uh, has a, a very limited effect on overall utility in these marshes. And there's a reason for that, because <clears throat> as I said earlier in the simulation, this marsh does, this model does take into account uh, sedimentation rates uh, as a function of uh, how often a marsh is flooded. Um, and so uh, these are, we use the marsh equilibrium model to develop some relationships between accretion or marsh elevation change um, on this, on the vertical axis, and where the marsh currently is in terms of elevation on the horizontal axis. And we calibrated that model uh, to data, uh, which are the dots on this. And for New York, uh, the relevant uh, data points are these red dots and these red uh, dashes. Um, so it's not a very strong feedback, not like when you get into really high sediment areas, um, like in the in the Hudson River, <clears throat> um, but there is a feedback um, that, that is suggested there. Um, and so what, what this suggests is that, let's say you had a marsh that's currently at mean tide level, and you say, okay, it's about to be drowned, let's add 20 centimeters of, um, of uh, let's, let's do a thin layer deposition of 20 centimeters to raise that and give it some elevation capital. And that might move it, depending on the tide range, somewhere like, I don't know, maybe a third of the way down this, um, of this between mean tide level and mean higher high water. So if you add that 20 centimeters, the, you're starting out at about 4.5 uh, milli millimeters per year with the marshes naturally creating, and you're moving it down to an area that's probably about 3.5 millimeters a year, meaning that over about the course of 20 years, uh, that differential is, is going to, it's basically going to cancel itself out. So you're adding some, uh, some fill to that marsh uh, but then the marsh is predicted to flood less frequently and, and get less um, inorganic sediment deposition on it. Um, and so that's part of the reason why, um, it, you know, at least thinking about the marshes in terms of this, where, where as sea level rises, the marsh um, floats down towards mean, te mean tide level and, and towards being flooded, um, that when you um, <clears throat> do thin layer deposition, you're essentially, you're buying some time. Um, so one of the more interesting results that came out of this is that we can look at the incremental benefits of each of the adaptation strategies. So this is the uh, incremental utility over the entire time period uh, that we've looked at. 
uh, as compared to the no migration, so the current marsh, the current situation. So obviously there's no incremental benefit to no migration because that's the base case. Um, when you do thin layer deposition, uh, there is some, some benefits, and you can see on a site-by-site -site basis it does differ uh, that Idlewild um, and W.T. Davis have the biggest potential for increases, but it's still small even compared to the migration to develop land. And you can see that um, Lemon Creek uh, would, you know, would have the highest potential increase in utility. If you look at restoration of 1974 wetlands, obviously that's a, a pretty large uh, job but uh, it does have quite a bit of potential for increased utility. Um, and uh, finally, um, migration to undeveloped land is, uh, had the highest impact on a total marsh area, which was therefore related to the, um, the, mar the, the utilities, the ecosystem benefits, the total ecosystem benefits that were um, produced. So this could provide you with a benefit side of a cost-benefit analysis, you knew the, the costs of each of these different, um, you know, either the purchase of, of, of undeveloped land or you know, some of these thin layer depositions, some of these procedures are, um, yeah, you could put costs, associate costs with those. Um, the last slide uh, that I want to look at here, summarizing results, um, show the benefits uh, predicted at 2100 for each of these sites. Uh, so these are um, the uh, incremental benefits that we just looked at. Uh, I mean, actually, they're not incremental because the, the base case is shown here. So this is the, um, the base case with no migration. But these black uh, squares represent the initial condition um, benefit. So you can see, based on sea level rise alone from W.T. Davis, uh, um, you know, given the uncertainty in the model, uh, the expected value is that you would lose about one third of your of your benefits you're getting from that, but you have a possibility through allowing migration undeveloped to mitigate some of that uh, through restoration of 1974 wetlands to mitigate even more of that. Um, for Idlewild, uh, it's interesting that when you combine all the adaptation strategies together, you end up with uh, roughly the same benefit as you as you currently have. So that's including sea level rise. So these two are subject to sea, these two are subject to uh, fairly high sea level rise losses predicted. Um, for Alley Creek in Queens, this was not as predicted to lose. This is one of the slow and steady um, sites that we pointed out where sea level rise is not predicted basically due to elevation capital, uh, tide ranges, and other factors. is not predicted to have as much of an effect. So actually with migration undeveloped, you could even have that um, marsh habitat improve in terms of ecosystem benefits potentially. So these are kind of interesting results. Uh, the final point that I wanted to make was that um, it's an interesting um, observation that uh, many of the marsh uh, fate models, um, you know, especially when they account for uh, marsh vertical movement um, and, and accretion rates, and they also account for marsh accretion feedbacks, where when the marsh starts to become flooded, that it, um, that it starts to accumulate more sediment for a number of uh, mechanistic reasons, um, are, would, wouldn't predict a, a, a lot of marsh loss under historic sea level rise rates. If you go somewhere between 2 and 4 millimeters per year, um, even up to 5 millimeters per year, there wouldn't be a tremendous amount of marsh loss predicted. The marshes would, in many cases, provided they have an adequate sediment supply, be able to keep up with that. Um, and so one question is, um, well, what about historic marsh loss rates? Uh, we've seen a lot of that you know, in Jamaica Bay, for example. Um, many studies are, are pointing at other factors, anthropogenic factors, whether it be uh, boat traffic erosion or whether it be uh, excess nutrients, which actually can um, cause a marsh to uh, become less viable, grow less root matter, and, and erode more rapidly. Um, and so what, one of the things that we just added to the model very recently was uh, an accounting of historic loss rates um, and, and, and incorporate that into the tool. So this is a, the base case that we've seen before. And this would be that same um, uh, case. But in this case, uh, we've accounted for the historic marsh loss rate, assuming that that would be additive to sea level rise losses. So assuming that that's a is not a sea level rise, so that's a you know there is a there's a bit of an assumption going into that. But if you are willing to accept that the historic loss rate, uh, also assuming that it remains constant, doesn't increase, or the nutrient conditions doesn't get cleaned up, so it just gives you another another way to look at the model results, and you can see that the utility 
uh, of these marshes, um, there, is, there is an effect, obviously, on the utility of these marshes if the historic loss rates continue. And uh, I th what we'll do for our final product is that we will take some of these marsh loss simulations and build them into some of these types of, uh, of long-term benefit uh, analyses. And that, uh, that's an update on our, our project, which we um, should uh, be finishing up um, you know, within this calendar year, I would, I, I would think. OK. All right. Thank you both so much. Um, let's see. I wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. You can ask questions by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. Or you can, um, if you have working audio, you can raise your virtual hand, the little hand icon in the user interface, and I can unmute you. Um, so a qu couple of questions so far. Um, there was a question, it was very early on, but uh, whether there's any plans or, or funding to do any of this work in New York. Oh, to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to do the adaptation strategies. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, well, not, the, that, not the analysis. I, no, no, that's fine. I know that New York City Parks is working hard on that, and, and, I, I, um, and uh, I don't know, um, you know, the... Um, I can't speak to the status of the funding, but I, I know that they that they are they have been a very important partner in terms of us in terms of setting this up, uh, defining the parcels, defining the strategies that they're interested in examining, um, and so um, you know, uh, I would defer that question to them. Okay, all right, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and there was a question as to whether there's any plans to expand this to other areas of the country. And I guess I, I'd expand that question to like, is, is it possible to do this in other areas? Well, yes, the, the, the whole uh, concept of this, uh, this tool that we built here is that it's actually very, e if you have a SLAM simulation, it's very easy to pull those into the tool and then you just need to uh, pick your parcels and do your survey. So the, the, the tool that we're building here, uh, which is going to be an open source, uh, even the uh, SLAM is an open source piece of software, uh, and, the, um, and this, um, this other piece, this economic model uh, in Visual Basic is, is going to remain open source. So, um, but the, the, the concept is, is to, to, to uh, allow this, anywhere there's a SLAM simulation, you can do this. Um, and, and SLAM, uh, yeah. I, so I think uh, there's no, we don't, we're not, we don't know, this hasn't been released yet, so uh, obviously people outside of our group um, can't do it yet, but that's our hope. Okay, great, thank you. Um, oh, and then a question, when will it be released? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that what we um, can... Um, you know, for for people who are in, engaged in the process, we've already we have released some drafts of the of the spreadsheet, um, and so upon request, um, you know, assuming that our um, client is amenable to that, then we can release some some uh, working drafts. Uh, but the whole project, uh, we anticipate wrapping up um, this calendar year or or slight, and then I don't know, you know, whether there's any um, review process that would have to go through after that. But um, you know, sometime in the very near future. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and what would it take for an entity to run this analysis? Let's say they were starting with SLAM from scratch. Well, it's an inter I mean, the SLAM model um, has a, a long um, history and, and it was really developed uh, in, in uh, an era of, of, of uh, not very much data. Their LIDAR was not on the scene. Uh, GIS was, didn't even exist or, or was just in its infancy. And so, um, th uh, but it has grown much more complex uh, with, you know, accretion feedbacks and, um, and, and, and a lot more careful accounting for tide ranges and uncertainty analysis and the like. So, um, I, mean, I think um, the, the question of what it takes to, to, to apply the SLAM model, there, there's a lot of different sort of uh, uh, flavors of SLAM application. There's some that are, are sort of quick screening level tools to see what areas might be, uh, might be flooded. And there are other, um, the NYSERDA uh, funded a, a fairly sophisticated analysis which included the, uh, the calibration of an, another model to mechanistically account for uh, accretion rate feedbacks and so it's, it's you know the, the, it, there's a there's a range like what um, but once you have a slam simulation uh, then then this uh, 
the, the capability to import data into this tool um, and then use the, the kind of um, surveying process um, uh, should, should not be a, a tremendous uh, burden, I don't think. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Sure. Um, another question. How did you choose the decision support tool above other available model applications? Uh, were there other interfaces with which it needs it, with with which it needed to be compatible? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would probably need some more specifics in terms of what the other model applications and um, uh, I think that um, yeah, I, I'm afraid I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, well, I would just I would just say the uh, to whoever asked that Warren Pinnacle developed Slam, so it would be a natural fit for them to work with Slam oh, on this if, application. If right. I mean, if, they, if they're asking about um, if they're asking about the right Slam, uh, it's in, it sounded like they're asking about uh, the decision um, yeah. support tool versus other decision support tools, um, and um, I think we just needed to build something that we could um, uh, pull. First of all, it's it's not a the, the decision support tool itself is not a tremendously it's not a tremendously complicated or sophisticated operation. So building something in Visual Basic uh, probably seemed just as easy as trying to take somebody else's model framework and and, and bring our results into it. But um, but it, it definitely gave us the flexibility to, to export all of our uncertainty analysis results uh, and then um, and then calculate a expected utility for each uncertainty analysis iteration and then now I don't know there may be other tools that already do that but I, I was not aware of any other tools that did that that we could just sort of snap the slam results into okay all right thank you sure. um, another question could you speak on why the state is trying to restore to a previous condition uh, historical wetlands maps rather than a desired resilience scenario for example 20 centimeters of sea level rise You know, I, in terms of the, um, I don't think I can. <laughs> no. So the, so can I speak on why they're the 1974, the restoration of 1974 wetlands. Why is that a priority as opposed to um, uh, something about? Or I guess, wait, are there any general benefits to trying to restore to a previous condition versus uh, a desired resilience scenario, to a to a, a sea level rise condition? Well, I guess I, I my, and you know, again. Some of these questions are going to have to be addressed to the people who are, are, are making these scenarios and, and trying to and evaluate them. But my thought would be uh, just that they're trying to do their due diligence um, in terms of um, understanding what the effects of these different actions might be. Uh, in some cases, it may be that uh, you know restoration of the 1974 wetlands and and construction of like erosion boundary or whatever would have to be done, uh, you know, is is probably not. Viable, but at the same time, you can get a sense of, of what effect that might have. Um, so I guess I think it's more just due diligence right now, as opposed to there being. I would hate to think that uh, in this presentation that we're um, sort of uh, publishing any any future state policy. I, I don't think that we are. I think that this just uh, just trying to understand uh, the benefits and the drawbacks of different approaches. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. And uh, Rebecca, I can actually uh, unmute you if you do want to speak, but I'll read what Rebecca had to say and I'll actually unmute her too. Uh, I'll take me a second. Okay, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, if you did want to speak, you're able to. Oh, you don't have a microphone. Okay, never mind. Um, but Rebecca from New York City Parks said, um, uh, basically we do not have available land restore inland considering the highly developed environment so restoring out to historic areas is the most viable option to restoring the extent of salt marsh so great thank you Rebecca for contributing that um, and we don't have any other questions right now so if uh, if you do have any go ahead and send them or alert me that you are sending them um, and Jonathan and Marco is there anything you want, guys wanted to show to wrap up um, no, I don't think so. I was just going to go back to some of these URLs um, because I think they, you know, people want to um, to look at it further. Um, I, I um, uh, just in terms of an overview, I think that we're 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 excited about the use, the combined use of the of the 
prioritization, the, the potential power that the prioritization tool has, um, uh, the, the sort of the economic tool in, com in combination with modeling adaptation strategies uh, to, to really um, to help people um, understand you know, the potential differences here. <clears throat> the other thing to point out is that um, if you want to plan, these are uncertainty analysis. These are uncertainty analysis simulations that include a sea level rise rate that um, that ranges from uh, about 0.4 meters by 2100 through 2 meters by 2100. Now, both of those are given fairly unlikely possibilities, and and the density of sea level rise scenarios is is in the middle towards a more likely, uh, I don't know, 0.8 to 1.2 uh, meters of sea level rise. But if there was a specific this model can also be adapted to um, plan for a specific sea level rise scenario or, or, or plan for a worst case, um, as the case may be. So I think there's a, a lot of flexibility um, in there. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Uh, this was a great presentation. And uh, this our, oh, wait. All right. There's one more question that came in. Um, there, there was thanks that sent in, but one more question. Sure. Do you have or, or know of a means to of quantifying the amount of flood protection benefit in relation to the size, extent, elevation of, of a marsh? Well, um, Marco, do you want to speak to that one or do you want me to handle yeah. that one? No, so, yeah, I mean, the, the one of the aspects of, of this tool is really the flexibility and the utility can be improved as uh, more uh, knowledge come in. And right now, the way we we kind of evaluate the, the flood protection is really, as all the utilities, really a relative uh, um, importance between the different parts. And so we are not really measuring uh, energy loss, for example, if there, is, there are some waves, but we just uh, choose the, the width of the marsh as an indicator that the, 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 the more wide the marsh is, the, the more effective in protecting uh, against a, a, a storm uh, is effective that marsh system. But it is really a relative measure just to rank the different parts. So we're not trying to actually measure what the marsh is doing on the energy of the waves. Right. So what we what we've done what we've done is, as Marco said, is. Um, Kind of use a, in the current implementation, we've used a fairly simple rule of thumb, which was that the energy absorbed is proportional to the width of the marsh. If you assume the width of the marsh, when you can calculate the width of the marsh um, uh, relative um, to the uh, infrastructure that's behind it. So, um, what we, what, um, although uh, you know, we, we recognize that more complex models suggest that there is a, um, a it's a more relation. A more complicated relationship that needs to take into account uh, likely storm tracks, etc. Um, and so, those if, the more data that we have, I think the more that we could fill that in. But for right now, we have a fairly simple relationship. Uh, but at the same time, we do take into account the, the the width of the marsh and how that changes over model predictions. And also, we can take into account the amount of infrastructures behind a particular marsh. So, if you have one marsh that is essentially a marsh island. Uh, then it's flood protection, um, at least it's immediately local flood protection. I mean, there may be some indirect effects, but it would have a much lower flood protection benefit than a marsh that uh, fringes upon some fairly intense development with high economic value. Okay. All right. And with that, thank you, guys. Uh, we will wrap up. So thank you again for presenting. And um, there's thanks coming in from, from participants. Uh, so we appreciate it, and we look forward to uh, catching up on uh, more of what's new at SLAM in the coming years. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much for the forum. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. And thank you, everyone, who was able to attend today. We hope we uh, see you on future webinars. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>